Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Pat Kupetkov. Um, I am director of security for a company called Onfido. And um, on Tufido, we basically specialize in identity verification. Um, so sometimes, some other life in the past, uh, people ask me what I do for a living, and I usually use uh, the poor excuse of saying I'm in IT or I'm in security. Uh, but my true job title as a director of security for Onfido is that I protect um, actual people's identities. Uh, we sit on the fair front for a lot of the fintech companies that you know today. And um, as a result of that, we have a big responsibility on our head, on our hands. And so um, <clears throat> as a company who specializes in a lot of cutting edge technologies, not only we invest in uh, cutting edge research that covers machine learning and other areas, but we also heavily invested in security. So um, this is why I'm here today. I'm here to talk to you about uh, zero trust security. Now, this is my third time on this stage. Uh, in fact, um, almost no one here knows, but me and Francois, who is your host, uh, we used to work together. And uh, he pitched the idea of DevSecCon five or six years ago. And I didn't quite believe him, but he invited me on the first conference. And I was uh, so glad that he did, because I, that, at that time, I didn't quite understood what this is all about. Um, my first, um, uh, OK. So my first presentation uh, when I came in, uh, and the reason I'm giving you this is because I just want to show you my own personal growth uh, uh, from where I was to where I'm here today. The first presentation that I did was called Why Your Security Sucks. Um, and this was my take on why companies fail when they actually try to stay secure. Um, back in the days, my background was pretty much offensive security. I was uh, already six, seven years as, penetration, as a professional penetration tester. In fact, I worked for some of the early companies that were performing pen tests in UK. Uh, when I started, uh, I didn't even knew that uh, I was able to practice the skills to, as my, and, and essentially earn a, a wage for this. Um, so I did not think much of defensive security, and uh, pointing the problem, uh, you know, uh, obviously was the easiest way to get out of the situation. We were writing the reports, we were sending it to our clients, and we're laughing at their vulnerabilities. Uh, that is the truth. But pointing the problem was not constructive enough. And so the next time when I came on this stage, um, I was a little bit more mature. And last year, I talked about uh, DevSec uh, ops as uh, being a building block to uh, good security. And I just started working on a project called Open DevSec Ops. And essentially, what Open DevSec Op is, is a collection, it's a blueprint of uh, Terraform modules, which you can start using today, and essentially, ramp up your investment in uh, security technology as part of your development cycle. But the problem with just using orchestration uh, as means to um, um, you know, automate your security processes is that it's just simply, again, a collection of blueprints. And uh, I was searching for the past year uh, something that is a little bit more tangible, something that also has a, a philosophical effect on people in organizations and generally how we deploy uh, applications and, and networks. And so, um, <clears throat> and so today, uh, this is the next logical step. And this is uh, zero trust security is essentially is the holistic approach to security, which I've been uh, playing around with uh, for the past one year. And the reason I'm talking to you about zero trust security today is because I firmly believe that the conditions are perfect for mass adoption of this approach. Uh, ha there has never been a perfect time to get involved uh, due to the availability of technology. And also, zero trust security is not just um, a set of rules and set of architectural diagrams. It's also a bit of a philosophy, which I'm going to cover next. So what is zero trust security? 
It's uh, not just a fancy name that security companies are using to sell you the next product. Uh, in fact, Zero Trust Security was coined by Forrester Research in 2010, and later it was adopted by Google as part of their initiative called Beyond Corp. Now, between uh, the model presented by Foresters and between the Google's approach, there is a, some fundamental differences. The Forrester approach is a little bit more high level. It's a little bit more theoretical. And Google's approach is slightly more architectural and slightly more technical. And obviously, Foresters is a research company. Google is a technical company. Uh, the key differences is that Forrester emphasizes on risk assessments, on zero trust operations, on micro segmentations, and also on the mindset behind zero trust. Google, on the other hand, emphasizes on what they call access proxy, the access engine, single sign-on, policies, and, and that sort of thing. Today's presentation, it's a little bit the hybrid approach uh, between um, Forrester's research and what Google, but I'm going to start from the technical element. So in terms of the beyond corp uh, architectural model, there's a, and this is basically a little bit of an oversimplification, but the, the three main components to the zero trust architectural model, and that is the single sign-on, which I believe everyone here in this audience is familiar with, the access proxy, which is essentially a layer seven device, it's a wrapper, and the application that we are trying to secure. An oversimplified diagram of that model looks like this. And essentially, uh, the way the whole thing works is that uh, instead of having the application, and the application has its own authentication and authorization system, you wrap the whole application into another device, uh, which is called the access proxy in the world of Beyond Corp. And then the access proxy essentially controls the access to the device. So if you think about it, it's kind of like a Portsman VPN tunnel. Every time you use SSH uh, to tunnel your way into some internal service, essentially you're doing the exact same thing. The difference here is that um, the usage of the web technologies is definitely a little bit makes the whole situation a lot more flexible rather than sticking with, uh, I don't know, like basic authentication or uh, digest authentication. At the end of the day, is really a reverse proxy with authentication bolted on top. The key thing that you need to understand, although this is super, super simple, I get it, the key thing that you need to understand is that you can't interface with the application. You can't even send a single packet to the backend application unless you first of all perform the authentication dance. Now, this is a, a fundamental thing that we need to keep in mind. Zero trust security, also it means zero VPN. Now, this is not explicitly mentioned in the papers published by um, you know, uh, Google and, um, and Foresters. But they do kind of mention the, the idea that, in many cases, you actually don't really need a VPN. The reason you don't need VPN is because um, usage of VPN today is really a stagnated experience, something that I, I believe probably all of you are familiar with and is definitely not uh, you know, a nice way to go about doing your work. Um, also, VPN does not always mean that you're fully secure. Um, a lot of organizations are supporting something called uh, split tunneling, which is enabled, which basically allows you to have two legs in two different networks. One of them is in the VPN network, another one in the insecure network, so it doesn't really do much. Uh, if you don't have split tunneling enabled, obviously all your traffic uh, will have to flow through the VPN network, which means that you will be adding more latency to the network. It's very, very expensive, but people do it. Uh, also, VPN is very inflexible when it comes to authentication workflows. Uh, what I mean by that is that even two-factor authentication looks like kind of a foreign experience because in most cases you need to put your username followed by password followed by PIN in the end, which is basically ridiculous. If you want to do something more advanced, for example, I don't know, authenticate the device. I mean, obviously that's done with the pre-deployed device uh, secrets, uh, but it's it's a very very kind of like a basic experience when it comes to VPN. Also, VPN uh, does nothing to cloud applications. Uh, so if you're actually using VPN a lot, um, but you know infrastructure is based in AWS or Google Cloud, it means nothing. I mean, this infrastructure is readily available to anybody who actually has the authentication keys. So VPN is also not used all the time. I mean, 
today's workforce is not physically located in the same building. Uh, we do a lot of more remote working. We travel a lot more. We have to go to hotels. We have to go to airports. We have to connect to networks where perhaps VPN simply does not work. So how do you go about and actually do your work when you cannot even log in into the corporate network? So one of the challenges that the, or one of the things the Zero Trust uh, wants to avoid is the whole usage of a VPN altogether. So here's the philosophical view of Zero Trust. What if the next big think tank company is in fact built on top of a coffee shop network? Now, for those of you who work for startups, this doesn't sound like a, such a bad idea because probably you are using a lot of co-working spaces uh, where you're sharing the same Wi-Fi as everybody else. Now, if you, if you work for a company who is more established, obviously that's not the case because, uh, you know, they already have that infrastructure that they built 10, 15 years ago. Uh, for big corporations, this is definitely a foreign concept. And also, what if the cloud is your network? Every computer is connected directly on the internet. Now, I know that this sounds a little bit weird, especially coming from my mouth, considering my experience, but just stay with that thought for a second. This is how I believe most organizations are set up today. First of all, we start with the layer of trust. We trust everything that we deploy. We build networks. We call them secure networks, corporate networks, or whatever you want to call them. But there is a, some sort of inherent trust that this is a secure network. Only our employees can actually access that network. Your home network also have that kind of level of trust. You basically assume that all the devices connected to your home network are your own, no, not the attackers. This uh, essentially leads to a lot of bad assumptions. We're just basically building up a lot of assumptions that are simply not true. Bad assumptions lead to bad designs. Bad design leads to, bad, to a lot of insecurity. I mentioned this um, earlier, but the world's top organizations or the world's top cloud providers are essentially built as OPAC networks. Um, the applications that they provide, you don't access them via a VPN. You don't access them in any other ways but through your own browser. Um, it is a bit ridiculous to apply a lot of emphasis on your security for, from internal corporate, uh, corporate network point of view, and at the same time forget the fact that you have to use all these external services which actually have a direct effect on you. Uh, I'm not a big fan of threat modeling, but you know, if you do the threat model, you realize that actually you know, we're trying to do something that can be defeated via a backdoor. None of these services are available over the VPN, and I'm not saying that third-party security is actually not important still. But what if we flip that model upside down, and we start with zero trust from the very beginning? So in other words, we simply assume that we operate in a fully hostile network. Yes, it is the corporate network, but we already assume that it's compromised. And then if we assume that it's compromised, then we start probably building a good design in all our decisions, right? Which, um, which actually follows with very good assumptions because the design now is good, the assumptions are good, and then we still trust, we still trust people, but we trust and verify. And this is really what I call starting from the first principle. The internet is built like that. Nobody's going to build an application, put it online, and assume that they're not going to get attacked. They will in the next 15 minutes. But we don't apply the same thinking model for internal applications, uh, which actually serves some of the most critical pur uh, purposes in our organizations. Zero trust security is actually virtually free today. Uh, you can build a zero trust security model relatively easily. Now, almost every single cloud provider supports um, components that can be used to create that type of architecture. And I'm going to just very quickly um, use AWS as an example because that's the one that I know uh, better than any, anyone else. Uh, in, in the AWS, in AWS um, cloud environment, uh, 
you have uh, the single sign-on, which you can adopt from outside, but also you can use the AWS single sign-on. You have something called the ELB, the Application Load Balancer, which I believe anyone who has deployed application in AWS understand what Application Load Balancer does, another layer 7 device. And you have something that binds them together, which is the OpenID Connect. Um, in order to set this up in AWS, um, again, we are following the same model as before. Um, all you need is a several lines of Terraform, and essentially you can have your own zero trust security architecture uh, up and running. Um, essentially, in this very simplistic diagram, we have the uh, ALB, which is the firewall, or, well, you can call it the firewall, but the reverse proxy pointing to the application. The only difference is that instead of Instead of the traffic simply flowing through the application, the first hop before you even start sending packets to the application is um, the authorization step, which you need to go to another system, the single sign-on system, authorize yourself, or log in if you like, and then only then you can use uh, the LB, uh, the application. So what does this look like the, as code? It's actually relatively straightforward. Uh, as I said, this is something that is right there in front of our eyes. And I just realized by talking to some of you that almost no one is adopting it. Um, it's not really cutting edge. It's been out for the last 10 years. And uh, this is an example how you would set up uh, a application load balancer to essentially use a single sign-on as the first hop in the journey to the application. Now, for those of you who have been listening carefully, you might actually say, well, this zero trust security also means single point of failure. And you're kind of right to some degree, because obviously if you have problems with your single sign-on system or your application load balancer is not configured properly, then you have a problem, right? And um, my response is that it does not have to be so basic. Uh, you can, in fact, uh, take that architecture, extend, and elaborate on top of it. Here is uh, one uh, proposal. Um, so one best security practice that comes from the Department of Defense of the United States, and in fact, I believe that there is a similar standard here in UK, is that when you set up a firewall, you have to do, uh, you have to be double layered the firewall. What that means is that you have one firewall, which is one make, and you have a secondary firewall that sits behind the same firewall, which is completely different make. And you configure both firewalls in a completely different ways. What, does the, what this does is that if you make a mistake in the first firewall, that mistake will not propagate on the second firewall. Hence, it's double layered. Now, in this architectural design, we have something similar uh, in nature to, to this. Essentially, we have the first access proxy that is not going straight to the application, but actually forwards to the next access proxy. And the first access proxy is, is only uh, authenticatable by the first single sign-on system, and the second access proxy is authenticatable by the second single sign-on system. Keep in mind that the second single sign-on system also perhaps is authenticatable by the first access proxy. In other words, you cannot even actually reach to level two unless uh, unless you pass level one. So um, that means that even if we make mistakes on the first layer, the second layer essentially provides a level of defense. This is the diagram that excites me the most, which is sort of related to uh, my line of work and also uh, on Fido as an identity provider. Well, not as an identity provider, but as a, a company who provides identity verification. So in this diagram, what we have is a similar situation as before. But then the second stage of authentication is identity verification. Now imagine that you have a super critical internal application, and you want to put the application on the internet. Obviously, you know, putting a single sign-on system on top of it wouldn't actually work. Uh, but what if once you pass the username and password authentication with the two-factor token, then you hit with a step where you need to verify yourself with your biometrics. That makes it slightly harder for someone to fool the application before you even actually start talking to it. Um, and so on. Uh, one particular uh, thing that I want to mention is the use of risk engine. 
and uh, I have uh, saved a special place for this one, is because uh, what we could do in this uh, zero trust security architecture is to make that access proxy quite smart um, to perform things like continuous authentication and continuous authorization. Uh, for example, um, imagine that uh, today, um, you know, I'm John, I log in into the application and my behavioral heuristics are the same, you know, same location, same authentication, same device. But tomorrow, because I have to travel, then, you know, uh, I end up in Paris, now I try to authenticate the application, but be the heuristics are completely off. And so this is probably the stage where I can hit the user with another uh, step of, author of authentication. Uh, with some sort of a challenge. And again, this could be either identity verification, could be something else, for example, verifying the device. Um, also, interestingly, if you think about the situation where, let's say, you have a uh, data exfiltration that is happening right now, uh, what do you do? Uh, in most cases, you can go and you know, disable the account, but the user already has uh, access to the application, they have a session token already. So unless you go and you know invalidate the session that the user currently have, you're doing nothing. The account is disabled, but the session continues. In many situations, you might find um, you know uh, in in many organizations, I would argue that once you disable the user, the user can continue having access to your assets without even you realizing it, because they can continue the session going for you know because it doesn't expire. And so if we use this access proxies, this means that we have also a single point from where we can completely cut the communication between the user and the application because we control this very, very tightly. It's not based on behavior of the application. It's pr primarily based on how we configure uh, the proxy itself. And this is done via this risk engine. Um, now I must admit that uh, this is getting really, really complicated, especially if you want to support a lot of uh, different, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, com more complicated um, uh, rules, if you like. Uh, but uh, one idea that uh, I'm currently work, you know, trying to implement is that the access proxy also injects uh, client-side components into the application so that we can uh, kind of like learn what the application does and at the same time um, you know, try to provide a good experience if the user is denied access and they are forced, for example, to perform uh, another challenge um, to verify themselves. Uh, unfortunately, none of these are really off-the-shelf solutions. Um, so uh, it's basically in the realm of research right now. Now, as someone who is responsible for security, uh, in their organization, uh, my main job is to make sure that I set my team for success. And so I went ahead and tried to understand what's the impact of zero trust security to security operations. So there are many tactics that you can use, but I'd like to use this one. And um, there is a slightly different angle. Now, if you want to understand the complexities of interactions between people in a team, uh, you can use this uh, quite famous, well, you can use uh, combinatorics essentially, is to compute how many interactions you need if you have a team of, let's say, five. Uh, in a group of five, you have uh, five times five minus one, which is four divided by two, and that gives you the total number. Uh, this is not the only strategy of actually measuring complexity, but stay with me. Now, if we plot this, if we plot this uh, on a graph, you'll realize that with the number of um, interactions between people in a group, uh, the, the actual complexity is getting exponentially bigger. Uh, it's, it's quite simple. And, uh, and again, this formula is pretty much uh, used for measuring interactions within group. But the way I see it is that the the interactions are between people and systems in my team. So for example, if I have a team of five, I also include also all the other systems they have to touch. So if we're using CMs and if we're using other products, they kind of become part of that group. And when I run this formula, I get um, kind of like representation of how complex it is to manage this team. Now, 
if we have a little bit of a zoomed view, you will find out that at, uh, at 16, which uh, again, this includes the number of people uh, plus the number of systems that we need to operate and manage. This means that the number of interactions, the total interactions between all the systems and all the people is in fact 120. And this is a staggering number. So really, uh, from organizational point of view, what I really try to do is to reduce complexity. So I, I try to consolidate things so that we get that number under a manageable um, regions. And what I believe Zero Trust Security does for me is that it narrows down the view to a handful of resources, a handful of systems, and then I can try to make them perfect rather than uh, having my attention on like, hundreds of systems, hundreds of applications, and I'm just wondering, I have no idea what's going on in all of them. So I believe the trick to secure is really to consolidate and simplify. Uh, and then let the machines do their work rather than we work for the machines. So really zero trust security uh, is all about consolidating the efforts uh, into fewer business, uh, fewer building blocks. It's about behavioral heuristics and it's also about good defaults. But I think most of all, it's also about philosophy and the way you look at security and the way you look at the way you build your systems. If you start with the basic assumption that everything is compromised and you were operating in a hostile environment, the kind of decisions that will prop, you know, um, the kind of decisions that you're going to make as a follow-up are uh, a lot more constructive and it will help your process um, to go a long way. So. All right. So the key question is, uh, what if we build uh, internal applications? And essentially, it doesn't really matter if they're internal application or external application, but what if we build applications if they will be used by our customers one day? And this is literally the strategy that AWS took so many years ago. And you can actually see how successful that strategy was for them, because they can open up all you know, avalanche of products simply because they start up with the basic assumption that all the products they built when they were small, uh, they operate in a hostile environment. Now, I don't know if it's true, but what I heard is that you know, once you set up a product in AWS uh, or you start building an internal product, then you need to take care of the security, you need to take care of scalability, nobody's going to do that for you. Uh, and over time, that converts into more resilient infrastructure, and you can deliver more software. Uh, and essentially, um, the purpose of the security team really is to not vet every change in that case. Uh, the purpose of the security team is then to sandbox and to provide good defaults so that, um, you know, for lack of better words, developers don't shoot themselves in the foot if, for example, they understand, you know, some intricacies about technologies. Uh, if you look at, for example, what Apple is doing with the iPhone, if you look at, for example, some of the strategies not so successfully that are deployed on Android, they are pretty much manifestation of the same thinking. Uh, yes, there will be some constraints to how you can deploy applications, but those constraints are good. Uh, and this is much better than, for example, making sure that every single change in your code uh, actually makes sense security-wise, because frankly speaking, um, that I don't think this works. And uh, with that, I am happy to accept some questions. And if you don't have questions, I have prepared two questions of my own. Anyone? All right, let's warm up. So the first one, how much zero trust security do you use? So at Onfido, uh, we have just started using that model. Uh, we haven't fully adopted it. But so far, the results are quite positive, I believe. 
and we are going to continue experimenting with this technology in the uh, next several months. But I'm actually quite uh, certain that it will deliver, you know, good results. Um, There's a question. Is there a microphone here? Where is it? Oh, you're right there. Thanks. Uh, hi. So uh, I have a, a simple question. Uh, most of you, the zero trust security uh, elements you mentioned here <laughs> are mostly about the human to machine interaction. Uh, how do you think that these apply between machine to machine interaction, so service to service interaction? Yeah, um, that's a very good question because uh, that wouldn't work. Uh, obviously, for machine to machine interaction, we need something else. <laughs> and of course, it, it, it's not, I mean, again, there is a two sides to it. The first one is the philosophical element. Uh, if you build a service, uh, even a microservice, you have to assume that the service that communicates to that microservice is already hostile, right? I mean, that's the good, that's the good design. <coughs> uh, so, you know, the philosophical element of zero trust security still applies. The practical element of what Google has created is beyond corp architecture. Obviously, it wouldn't work because that's designed for, you know, human to system rather than system to system. Um, but I think, you know, it's the same as today. You know, there's no difference, really. <laughs> okay, so this is another one. Does zero trust security solve all possible attack vectors? No, it doesn't. Okay, so you can always uh, find new ways to go about attacking applications and not necessarily via the front door. But if we can secure the front door, that kind of is a big relief, really. Uh, you know, you saw earlier in other presentations where, you know, you can attack the dependencies of the application, you can try to compromise the developer that maybe have access to the application and so on and so forth. Uh, so this would require very different type of models. But uh, zero trust security, what it does is, at least from application perspective, it simplifies the whole management uh, of the application and how you authenticate and authorize users. Cool. Any more questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much then. <laughs> <laughs>